Hello everybody! This video is intended to complement my substack called My Everyday Routine where I explained uh, the routine I followed every single day uh, in the period before becoming a Grandmaster. In that post I uh, explained that uh, the book I used for everyday training was Kasparian's uh, book on domination studies. And in this, vi this video I would like to show you uh, what that work comprised of, the difficulties I encountered and how I, in most of the cases, solved these studies. So the position you see here is actually one of the first studies in the book. Uh, and as the book says, it's a book on domination. So um, the problem, the first problem I usually encountered uh, in, in these studies was uh, the problem of overwhelm. Now, what, what do I mean by that? So you see here, the position is pretty empty. Uh, the board is empty. There are a few pieces on the board. And the first impression I get, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you do, is that when you see an empty board, you get overwhelmed that so many options are possible, perhaps too many options are possible. And in a way, again, I will describe my feelings but I, I kind of have an impression that a lot of players have these feelings, is that you kind of almost panic. Ah, what can I do here? He can play everything. There are so many moves. Look, the bishop can go here and here and here and here and here. Everywhere. The king can come take my pawn. The king can come here to control my knight. Is h1 important or not? So you get the law. You see, at first sight, you get this impression that there are too many options and you get this like a flood in your head and the first instinct at least to me is that the brain protests the brain wants to give up the brain wants to stop the brain doesn't want to explore these options but it just wants to kind of uh, get out of this uh, uncomfortable sensation and this leads to, to to different types of shortcuts when you just play a move Okay, you just avoid the uncomfortable situation, you play a move and you're, you got over with it. And this is very, very, very wrong. This is wrong. So the first step you need to make in such situations is you need to override your initial impulse to just play a move. The first one that comes to mind, something, just to get out of this uncomfortable situation. And um, this study by Reti, actually, it's a very, very good example of uh, the problem and the solution to that problem. So the first thing you need to do is take control over your brain. And that means overriding this uh, very strong desire to just play a move and, and, and just get out of the uncomfortable situation and calm down. So calm down, okay? Don't do anything. Just calm down first. And then the second step is to carefully and patiently explore the moves. So what happens in this board, in this situation here? So you can see that black actually wants to go after the pawn on a5 with king b5 and just take it. Therefore the natural move here is knight d4 check because it also takes away the square from the king. Now if white is allowed to take the pawn on h2 he will be two pawns up with a winning position. Therefore, black must play the move king c5 to keep the knight in check, even though you may notice this. Even at first sight, you may panic and say, oh, my knight is hanging. But you may notice that the knight is actually not hanging because a6 and the pawn promotes because the bishop is not in time to control the a7 square. And then the pawn promotes. But here comes the critical point. What do you play next? Now, the problem of overwhelm is not for the opponent's options, but your own. Oh, I can play this, I can play that. What do I play here? Do I give a check on e6? Do I give a check on b3 uh, defending my pawn? Do I play f3? Do I take the pawn? What do I do? So, for a second time, you get the problem of overwhelm. The solution, again, is the same. Calm down. Don't panic. Okay, just don't panic. Calm down and make sure you check the options one by one. 
in situations like this, when it seems that you have a lot of options, and you do, a very useful thing to do, actually, is to ask yourself, okay, if it were my opponent's move, what would he do? Okay, I don't play a move, okay, my, it's my opponent's turn, what is his threat, what is he going to do? And then you start checking, actually, your opponent's ideas and moves. So, what can the opponent play here? And then, again, very patiently, check your opponent's options one by one. You may get scared at this, because it appears, ah, how can I check so many options? Look, the bishop he has an empty board, it can go everywhere. The king can go, okay, not maybe to b5 or d4, but maybe just go back to d6 or go to somewhere else, okay? It may appear that it's too many options again. So again, the brain would like to make a shortcut, check maybe one or two, and then you play a move. But this is wrong. Especially in end games, it's important to check often all, and I mean literally all, opponents' moves. Now, the trick here lies under the surface. You may see, how can I check all the moves? There are so many. But the trick is actually, if you dedicate your time at literally checking all the moves, to your surprise, you will find out that the vast majority of your opponent's moves are actually very bad and can be refuted very quickly. And in fact, this leaves the opponent with only a few actually decent moves. This obviously applies to more complex endgame than this one, but this one is a good example of, I think, uh, um, overcoming the panic attacks. In more complex endgames, you will see that after you check all your opponent's moves, uh, you discover that you only need to check in greater depth, perhaps one, two, or three. And this is the secret. Yeah? Not to panic, to actually dedicate the time to check the opponent's options and discover that actually you need to check very few of them. This example here is actually a good example of uh, what I just explained, that the vast majority of the opponent's moves are actually bad. And if you ask yourself, what is my opponent going to do here? You start, and you start checking actually what the opponent can do. This is what happens. Let's start with the king. Okay. Can, can the king take the knight? Eh? Not really, because as we said, a6 promotes. Can it go to c4? No, because a6 promotes again. b4? No, a6 promotes again. d6? I'll just make an empty move here for white, just to explain. d6? Nope. There is a check, and I win the knight. d5? Maybe. What about a6? And the pawn promotes. Did we check all king's moves? Yes, we did. b4, c4, d4, d5, d6. So, the opponent cannot move the king. Success! See? There are not that many as you thought at first sight. Let's go over to the pawn. Okay, h1. Okay, fine. You take it. Has anything changed? Not really. Let's check the bishop. Where can the bishop go? Look, it's a full open board. The bishop is a strong piece. It can go everywhere. Really? Let's check. Can it go to g7? Nope. Check. Bishop is lost. Can it go to f8? Nope. Same thing. Check. Bishop is lost. Where can it go? Can it go to g5? Not really. Check. Bishop is lost. Can it go to f4? Nope. Check. Bishop is lost. e3? Apparently not. You just pick it up. Can it go to d2? Nope. Check. Bishop is lost. Last move for the bishop. C1. Check. Bishop is lost. You see? We checked. Okay, I need to actually put these on the board because I want to just visually show you how many moves you have checked. So we checked with the king, king d6, king d5. Let's put king before a6. Let's put king c4, a6. Let's put king d4, a6. Did we put them all? Did we put king d6? No, we didn't put king d6, knight f5. Okay, actually we did. So look how many moves we checked. 
King D6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 moves 12 with H1. We checked 12 moves. When was the last time you checked 12 options for your opponent in a game you played? I would say never. Yeah. I, have, I haven't checked 12 moves for my opponent most likely. Yeah. But the key here is to see that all these moves are refuted in one move. So if you just overcome the panic, calm down, start checking one by one, you suddenly realize that you can refute all these options in a very simple manner. This is perhaps an extreme case when you actually all these moves are refuted in one move, but often in games they can be refuted in a few more. The bad ones, obviously. Yeah? So once you check and realize that your opponent has no moves, actually, then the solution is kind of clear. It's a Zugzwang. So what do you do? Don't touch anything. King h1. Game over. You stop h1, you eliminate one option, and all the others that remain lead to the loss of the bishop or promotion of the pawn. So you see, it's a simple, simple, well, two-move solution, but it included checking 12 candidate moves for your opponent. And this is just fantastic. This is the type of training everybody needs. At least I did. Because it teaches you discipline in your thinking. It teaches you self-control, not panicking. And it teaches you just to be patient and not fear checking many options of, for your opponent. This leads to a very important uh, aspect in your games, which is the um, notion of control. What does control mean in chess? That means that you're... Con Controlling the situation means that nothing can surprise you. You have checked all the moves, so whatever move that your opponent chooses, you have already seen it and have prepared, the, have prepared against it. So, this type of training is what I did on a regular basis for a full year, every single day for one hour, and, uh, well, uh, uh, it, it uh, got me the title. I started playing, I, I raised my level of play thanks to this uh, qualitative jump uh, in my calculations. I started playing much better and uh, I crossed the rating barrier of 2500 and I, I got the title. So this is the type of training you need. And I can assure you, if it worked for me, it will definitely work for you. And the key aspect, again, the key takeaway is not to panic, to calm down, okay, and patiently Check every single move of your opponent. This obviously applies more to end games, but it can also be done in middle games. For example, in a complex middle game situation, if you really uh, use your opponent's time to check all his options, you will, I think, 90% eliminate the danger of a blunder or a missed tactic for your opponent or for yourself. So this was the type of, of, of training I did. And um, I hope with this, uh, now we can say simple example, it didn't look simple at first. I managed to explain to you the, 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 the benefits of obviously doing uh, endgame study, uh, doing um, solving uh, endgame studies yeah, in general, and doing this type of calculational training. So I hope you, you found this useful. Again, if you haven't read my, my Substack post, my everyday routine, I invite you to do so and subscribe to my weekly Substack. And if you like also this type of content on my channel, also subscribe here. So I thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. And uh, well, I hope it motivates you also to do this type of work because even though not very pleasant, at least on the surface, it will definitely lead to a qualitative jump in your play. Thanks for watching, see you in the next video.